and how such a category may be used in uh, in the way one reads uh, movements, uh, ideas within the context of a disciplinary framework and the disciplinary framework that I am using today will be really art history. Um, so what I do is to start with a little bit about uh, the intellectual history of resistance and then push it towards how one can perhaps deploy this category, how such a category may uh, structure the way we uh, set up reading within uh, discipline. So that's roughly the structure of uh, my presentation here today. Yeah? Uh, when we uh, start with the idea of resistance, all of us will really know that the idea of resistance comes from the physical sciences. It is really a category of physics and when we talk about resistance, when we are talking about electricity, when we are talking about friction and so on, right? So, it, resistance is something which really impedes a smooth flow, which doesn't allow things to be as comfortable as they would be without this kind of obstacle in the way. So resistance is something which is uh, which doesn't allow things to be comfortable. All right. So if moving from this really uh, from physics really to the social, you find that the idea of resistance really can be. Uh, uh, usefully looked at in, as something which emerged from 19th century thought in the West. And specifically what we are looking at is Darwin. Not Darwin per se, but ideas like Darwin's which <coughs> circulate in social science spaces. In the sense that specifically Social Darwinism. Uh, if uh, one of the central ideas of Darwin's uh, idea of evolution was really that uh, evolution is something which happens not as a smooth and interrupted process, but <coughs> something which emerges through struggle conflict and uh, and through this uh, struggle and conflict newer forms emerge. What happens as most of you will know in the 19th century that these struggles, uh, uh, this framework of analysis was used to describe not just biological evolution as Darwin did but also social evolution and in fact social uh, Darwinism was one of the uh, key uh, uh, not methods but one of the central ways in which colonialism <coughs> for example was justified you know so when social Darwinism became a method for describing society you have the idea of society evolving. And when this marries the question of progress, you have the idea of evolution as a progressive moment. And this is not something that Darwin actually proposes. So uh, Darwin actually proposes movement and change. But social Darwinism works with evolution imagined as progress. Okay? So, and this progress, if you, uh, since it is social Darwinism, is not a smooth, happy uh, development which moves from a lower stage to a higher stage. 
but it is something which is fraught with uh, conflict, with resistances of various sorts. And it is over here that one can look at the way the term resistance begins to circulate in the way we understand the social. <coughs> yeah? And but this is not the only place. The other space where we can actually look at <coughs> the, the question of resistance is also in importantly Marxist thought. Where Marxist, uh, Marxist thinking really looks at conflict as a way from which you have <coughs> movement from different stages of human history. So again, the idea of conflict is built into the way one imagines a human history. A human history, as all of you will know, is something which is marked by reason. Yeah? So it is marked by the rational, but it is also marked by conflict. Yeah? So it it, it is in this notion of conflict that thing which refuses to allow movement and uh, to be simple and comfortable and smooth that one can perhaps locate the idea of resistance. Yeah? So now when you look at this notion of resistance as something which makes things uncomfortable. One would also need to go back to what Deepak Mehta was saying yesterday <coughs> about the margin. Well, the next question that we really need to ask ourselves when we look at conflict or when we look at resistance, which is very closely tied to conflict, is the idea of where does resistance come from. And it is here we need to kind of draw upon what uh, Deepak Mehta was saying yesterday that uh, you have in fact not just one margin but perhaps multiple ever receding, ever uh, uh, moving fluid set of margins with which to understand uh, social formation. So resistance really comes not from dominant spaces, we can say, but resistance comes from spaces which are essentially disempowered, essentially not, uh, not in charge, spaces which are, uh, there are spaces which Resistance can be weak or strong. Resistance can get transformed. <coughs> the spaces of resistance at one moment can be <coughs> deeply dominant at another moment. All that can happen. But <coughs> at the moment of resistance, one must understand that it comes from the space of disempowerment. Okay? So resistance is something which is tied to location and it is tied to the question of power. Alright? So having said that, one, so you can see that the idea of resistance <coughs> is uh, something which is less simple than a mere obstacle. Yeah? It's not just an obstacle. And it's not a simple, I am the margin and I will resist dominant uh, uh, class formation. But it is something that as margins move, the nature and style of resistance also gets transformed in very significant ways. Yes? So, so moving, so it is with this, these kinds
kind of 19th century antecedents that we really push the idea of resistance into the 20th century. Now, for me, resistance has been actually used in 100 different ways and it's the easiest uh, kind of uh, theoretical word which just floats all over the place and if you think of Rangde uh, Basanti, you say, we are rebel, everyone has a slogan on their t-shirts, we have Che Guevara on every t-shirt, maybe Bob Marley, but you know, if, and these are seen as symbols of resistance and stuff like that. But uh, for me, I think a useful figure in thinking about the question of resistance is really Walter Benjamin. Yeah? And Walter Benjamin, particularly in his thesis on history, has this wonderful uh, statement which I can't remember exactly, but he said that the task of history is to brush against the grain. So, and I think for, for all of us, so deeply located in academics, it's, it can be a kind of uh, the moment when we actually begin to see the way our academics is tied to our world. You know, like history or language studies or comparative literature, whatever discipline that you study, if you rub it against, you brush it against the grain, you will find another history there. A history that is telling another story, a minor story which you cannot even begin to see. A story that resists the dominant tale told by your discipline. Right? Yeah? So, the <coughs> point that Benjamin makes really is to find resistance in the most obvious, the most self-evident, the most natural and normal of places. He says even the norm has to be investigated for its own resistance. Yeah? So that's his argument. And it is this argument that I will really be taking forward in the context of uh, Indian art history. Now, Indian art history, who actually, uh, uh, many of you perhaps would not be very familiar with the trajectory of uh, the discipline of Indian art history. So, I will just say a little bit about that. And then I'll talk about how one can perhaps be resistant. Okay? Uh, if you look at the beginnings of Indian art history, uh, you'll really find it at the moment of colonialism. Because art history is essentially a Western discipline. In fact, art as a category is a Western discipline. Right? It's, uh, it's just like literature is a Western discipline. So also is art and history and so on. Now, uh, uh, colonial understandings of what is today characterized as Indian art was that it was uh, monstrous. And the word monstrous is in quotes and it's a word used by John Ruskin to characterize uh, Indian temple uh, sculpture. So he uh, called uh, figuration monstrous. And when, at, at, at the moment of nationalism, uh, okay, two more sentences on uh, uh, colonial uh, characterization. They were called monstrous because it was seen as uh, unrealistic. The ideal of Indian, uh, ancient Indian and medieval Indian architecture was seen as uh, 
unrealistic. It was uh, seen as uh, many armed gods were seen as uh, monstrous. It's uh, abstract figurations, for example, the figuration of uh, uh, the Kali or uh, uh, Jagannath at Puri were seen as bizarre, you know. So when you, uh, so this kind uh, just set up uh, the image of say uh, a Kali image against uh, the Madonna of Renaissance and you will see how colonial art historiography could not, its frameworks did not even allow Indian uh, image production to be art. Yet, they were confronted with great skill and great uh, technique. You know? So, what they did was to say that Indians have craft, but they don't have art. Art is something produced out of intellection, whereas craft is a skill. Yes? And so uh, the task really for a nationalist art historically was to rescue for a possible India, you know, the idea of how one can have an Indian art, a lineage, not just Indian art, but a lineage of Indian art. A lineage which will then be able to feed into uh, the project of modernity. If that is what is going to be the tradition to the modernity of our new images. Okay? So what happens as a consequence? Kumaraswamy and D.P. Havel are central figures here. So they are they made a new kind of argument. What they did was they said, yes, Indian art is unrealistic, but it is not just craft. It is idealized representation. And we made the claim that idealized representation is has as much claim to art as does uh, realistic re representation. Moreover, they mined Sanskrit texts and they picked up words like sadrishya and so on <coughs> to show that there was a tradition of naturalism and realism, even in the context of uh, Indian art production. And they were very sensitive in doing this. Alright? So, here then is one example of resistance to resist the claims made by colonial framework to set up new frameworks that produces for the project of nationalism a new discipline and this discipline is really modern art history for India. Yeah? And so we have that this moment where a nationalist in an art history is born. So you can see that this in nationalist art history is tied to finding images, finding sculpture, uh, re-examining existing existing. So it's tied to archaeology, to Indology. So it's, a, it's like a triad. Archaeology, Indology and Indian art history is like a triad. But this triad does not really account for current art practices. Current, by that I mean early 20th century. Now, what does, okay, see here we have ancient 
temple, okay, that idealized temple dedication, okay. But what about the work that, say, Avanindra Nathanur is doing? What about the work that, say, Durandar was doing? What about the work that was coming out of the art schools that Madras, uh, Calcutta, Lahore, Bombay, Varuna? What was all, how does one characterize? It's not ancient. <coughs> it's not idealist in the manner of ancient Indian art. So, how the next problem that the, the uh, modern Indian art history had to, can, uh, to confront was how to write a modern Indian art. Yeah? And how this modern art history can be tied to A, our past tradition, and B, to a future. Uh, a shining, modern, independent future of Indian. You know, so this play of modernity and tradition on one hand, and on the other hand, how to be like tradition and how to be separate from it, while also tying it to the question of nation. So this, these were the problems. So, uh, suffice it to say, that in the work, in the revivalist work of the Bengal school in particular, uh, you find uh, that, uh, uh, especially in the way they invoke Ajanta and Elura paintings, you find a new style of modernist painting being forged, a modernist painting which is of the present moment, but which invokes not the modern West, but the uh, East. You know, Bengal Revival looked to China, Japan for its models. Yeah? So it uh, set up that, that was one trajectory. The other trajectory was definitely Amrita Shekhi with her uh, triumphantly Paris uh, art training and her uh, resolute uh, use of her uh, contemporary art training to engage the contemporary Indian subject. So these two, and then of course you have the progressives and so on, and by uh, setting these up chronologically in modern Indian art history, uh, built it's canon. Okay? So just like you have a canon in literature, so also you'll have a canon in art history, right? So it built its canon by from these multiple diverse tracks. So you have then the building up of a nationalist art history. Now we come to uh, the specific argument that I would like to share with you. And this is about a specific category, the insertion of a specific category that is Indian woman artist into this nationalist story of modern India. And when I am doing this, I'm trying to build two types uh, to suggest that there are two types of resistance in practice when I tell you this to. One is the actual method and moment <coughs> where this category was forged. That is a moment of resisting this unmarked smooth flow of Indian art history. The second is a discipline, the resistance to a disciplinary formation, which is forced to uh, understand and acknowledge this category as a separate category of time. So you have two layers here of resistance. How? 
the problem is that the idea of resistance is predicated upon very importantly the idea of agency. Someone resists. It's not something that happens by chance. It's not like the rain that fell yesterday, just like that. You know, it's something which is set up. Yeah? And if it is something which is agentic, then it presupposes a success and a freely uh, acting autonomous subject. And as all of you know now, the idea of the freely acting autonomous subject is something which is so deeply problematic. Yet, provisionally, let's hold on to this idea of the autonomous subject and let's see how through this particular uh, method of telling the story, we can uh, look at the, the, the usefulness of the category of resistance and also its problems. <coughs> Alright? Okay. The, when I use a phrase like Indian woman artist, it's self-evident. It's like saying Indian woman novelist. You know, it's self-evident. Sashi Dilpande, uh, Anita Desai, and there are hundreds of theses on Indian woman novelist. But just like Indian woman novelist is a category that emerges at a particular point in time, Indian woman <coughs> artist is also something in the category that emerges at a particular point of time. And I would like to suggest that the word, the category begins to circulate only as late as 19, early 19, uh, 1980s. Yeah? If you look at a whole set, all the writing, catalogs or books or accounts, you don't find the term. It's not there. You know? And yet it is self-evident today. So what is it that happened and how was it made? It becomes so powerful. Okay? That's one of the things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, when we look at contemporary accounts like uh, post 21st century accounts of uh, Indian uh, of uh, Indian art historiography, there's always a chapter on Indian woman artists. But it's only a 20 year old term. It's not. It's not there before that. So when did it come? How did it? My suggestion is that if you actually look at that time, uh, it happened as a deliberate act, really, of four very important, today in today's world, very important artists. Nilima Sheikh, Nalini Malani, Arpita Singh, and Madhvi Parik. Today, they're all old women. They're, uh, in their 60s and their 70s. But at that point of time, uh, when they were roughly mid-career, they decided to do a set of exhibitions where they would all produce new work in watercolor, in small size format, and display these works together in a in four, five, or six different places which are not conventional galleries. Uh, the exhibition was called Through the Looking Glass. And if you, uh, through interviews, you find that these women artists were uh, um, they were not really encouraged to do so. And when you ask them 
why they did that. They said they wanted to reframe their, the way their work was looked at. Why? Because remember, this is also the time that the Indian women's movement was consolidating itself. Engaging with the new ideas that was happening in women's movement and also parallel feminist thought, this is also the time, uh, the first, uh, like you know, the beginnings of uh, women's writing in India was being put together. The first uh, uh, seminars and uh, group discussion around this, uh, these kind of projects will be put together. Sri Shakti Sagatna, we were making history. This was also something that comes up at that time. Recasting women. All these key texts were, were happening when these women decided to reframe themselves. Remember, these were women who were already established artists. It's not that they were suddenly starting out as that. All of these women had been exhibiting from the 1970s. So if they had a good 10 years of practice before they decided to do something like this. Yeah? So when they start doing this, the first problem they find is that they have no one to write about their work. They don't have anyone to write a catalog about their work. None of the established writers are willing to touch them because they say that we want to establish ourselves as women are. At last, <coughs> a person who is today quite famous, Ashish Radha Daksha, writes a catalog for them. And today when one reads, what he writes, one is absolutely amazed because these women are saying, look, we are trying to reframe our work in the context of feminist thought, but he refuses to what he calls ascribe feminist intent to this gesture of these poor women acting. And I just have to read what he says. Okay. Um, he says, Practice 
that now must be appropriated to support practicing artists. Women artists painting in the medium of watercolor may get relegated to a certain spot <coughs> that can only be overcome by an alignment of critical means with the effort being made by the artists to paint and now to exhibit. It's amazing to hear a person who would today, I am sure, be very unwilling to uh, speak like this. But in the 80s, it was not even possible to look at the term artist as the site where gender could be critically engaged with. Not just in the subject of its production, but also in as intervention in art institutional practices. So this is what I mean really when I'm talking about how this show and these works were resisted the characterization of what modern Indian art could, could be seen as. It, it challenged the way uh, modern Indian art could be framed, how it could be seen, and it resisted its uh, easily national model, modern style of, art, uh, of framing art production. So here I would I would present this really as a moment of that resistance. Okay? Ten years, it just took ten years of the life and to have this uh, category completely domesticated. In the Festival of India uh, exhibition, hardly six, seven years later, you have exhibitions entitled Indian uh, Women Artists and uh, that is sent off to America and to Russia and to different places. Uh, then there is um, hundreds of galleries uh, putting together shows like Navanayaka and the essence of women and all of that. And suddenly we have an already existing tradition of Indian women artists and Amrita Shekhar, who was never seen as an Indian woman artist, suddenly becomes an Indian woman artist. Lost Indian women artists are found again, Pilu Pochkanwala, Meera Mukherjee, all of these women are uh, found from Shanti Ketan and from JJ School and uh, stuff like that. So, as a tradition of Indian women art is actually uh, put together in less than five years ago. And at this point, it stops being the category Indian women art, it stops being really a category of resistance. You know? So, it, so something that actually sets up resistance need not, all, need not always stay there as a gesture of resistance. So gender which can be so productive can in some context be a deeply conservative uh, uh, what you say category. It can be used to push the most conservative of measures. You know? So there is no really fixed universal site of uh, resistance. So, like margins, resistance always moves. Yeah? And, yeah. So I stop here, I think. Is that worth... Another hour. Another hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
you know, lyrical, uh, robust, uh, uh, insightful, the whole range of terms we use to describe work, right? But these are also words which uh, allow disciplines to function in a very comfortable way, you know? And uh, the example that uh, Buddha you reminded me, because I wanted to give this example. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, for example, the uh, Dilema Sheikh's work. Dilema Sheikh's work has always been uh, described as lyrical. Yeah? It's a uh, and Lyrical, especially when you use it to describe Indian women artists, is a way of saying that their work is feminine and their work is soft and beautiful. Uh, it also somewhere suggests that it is very small, private, and uh, so on. And uh, I think Vilima <coughs> Sheikh is one person who again and again has in her work and even uh, uh, in her interviews and so on, has gestured to the way the, fem uh, the women's movement and feminist thought has uh, fed into her uh, articulation of the image. Um, no one calls feminist thought lyrical. Yeah, it's hard to do that. Not now. So, but uh, again and again, her work is something which has been uh, characterized as lyrical. Uh, what is the function of describing her work? I think? Why is that it attracts her work from the history. And it produces, even though they, it gestures to the feminine, it leeches the feminine of uh, the political. It uh, makes the work some private song of grief or pain or whatever. Yeah? And it refuses to allow history and politics to structure our understanding or our readings of that. So, although the category of Indian women artist was established even domestically, the nature and style through which it was domesticated was so, was for a person like me at least, uh, so deeply prom problematic because it looked at women artists as somehow very essential, somehow being if by nature different from and producing work from the realm of the private, you know. So, uh, in this, this work, for example, has been described by at least three major, major critics. Alright? This is a detail of a work hmm? <coughs> called uh, Melody. And if you look at this, it is something which, uh, if you say it's lyrical, you will find it's lyrical. But if, what if you don't call it lyrical? Huh? What if you start thinking, what, what is it that these women are doing? What are they holding in their hands? What are they sitting around? Hmm? What if one starts asking questions like that? And if you look at it, 
one person is holding, you can't see, I don't know how very well can see. One person is holding a blade branch, another person is holding all the paraphernalia of home, and another person is holding bones. All of them have very strange expressions. <coughs> But 
what if you brush against the grain? Yeah? And look at it, not just as something beautiful that circulates in the public sphere, but as an argument about life after pain. Life after a specific, specific uh, political life. So, one way of decentering uh, art as an object which is beautiful and uh, a beautiful cultural artifact is to actually look at art as a political argument. It's possible to do so. And uh, what I've tried to do with this series, then other small things, for example, look at that green, it, it's uh, the hint rather than, see it's like the way but we are trained to read literature. We do close reading of uh, uh, books, poems and stuff like that. In the same way, one can do close readings of uh, the nation. But one has to be, just like we are trained in literature, we need to be trained in the visual. Looking is not that you lack, not in reading. So uh, we need to train ourselves to look at the visual, you know, as a site where we can read and make arguments about this site, you know. And it is here where, you know, reading the visual and reading the textual come together in a really rich way. And I think, even if I have half an hour left, 